Welcome back everyone to Chip Stock Investor. If this is the first video you have ever watched, you're skipping to the good parts. If you've been with us since the beginning, you have watched a lot of rough videos while we have tried to figure this out. Thank you so much for sticking with us, your continued support and views while we continue to try to improve our content, analysis, and video production is appreciated. Today, we wanted to review what our semiconductor portfolio has done the past year. Nick, how did it go? It's gone very well. And we say this is a one-year review because this week, uh, the week of September 18th, is the one-year anniversary since we started the Chip Stock Investor Channel. It was one year ago that we dropped our first video explaining why we thought the semiconductor industry was going to lay the foundation for the next bull market. And since then, now everyone, it seems, is suddenly a semiconductor industry expert. A year ago, we got all sorts of comments from some people on the channel, on Twitter, on the articles that we work on that we're not going to make any money in these semiconductor stocks. In the midst of the, the bear market, there was hyper-focus on value, valuation being the only thing that matters, and very little forward-looking analysis on what was coming for the chip industry. And Casey, you said if you're skipping to now, you're skipping to the good stuff. Yeah, I, the video editing quality, that's all on you. Great job. But we've had a great year. I think let's take a few minutes to go over what we picked and what worked really well, what didn't work so well, and what we're looking at for the next year ahead. Before we dig too much into this, Nick, let's back up about a decade. And I have a quote from Mr. Mark Andreessen. He is a software engineer turned tech investor. He is co-founder of the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz. He said in his 2011 essay, software is eating the world. But did software really take over the world? And has it been a great investment? The, the gist of that essay, Casey, and Mark Andreessen said basically was that software companies were going to take over large chunks of the economy as we knew it. That was already happening in 2011. And of course, it most certainly accelerated through the 2010s. What's called the 2010s, like the era of cloud, of uh, SaaS software companies. But really, uh, along the way, you had companies like Amazon take over a massive chunk of retail. Of course, Google solidified its position as, as Google search and general organizer of the world's information. Meta became one of the world's most powerful companies. And definitely, you could probably argue the world's most powerful media company, media influencer. And the list goes on and on. Lots of industries taken over by software. So yeah, that did happen in the 2010s. But let me ask you this, Casey. Just because a new industry has popped up and taken over the economy, does that make it a fantastic investment? Not necessarily. Okay. And to hammer this point home, let, let me repeat a question that we talked about when preparing this episode that I think is going to surprise many viewers. So before you answer, Casey, let me, let me just ask the viewers to, to answer out loud at home or, or wherever you're watching this right now. Let's pick three ETFs and Pick which one you thought, without looking, without cheating, which one do you think did the best from January 1st, 2010 to January 1st, 2020? Let's call it like the, the software is eating the world era of the 2010s, okay? So we have the Spider S&P 500 fund, SPY. For our purposes, let's use the Vanguard Information Technology ETF, but you could alternatively use QQQ, the Invesco NASDAQ 100 ETF, QQQ. Take your pick of, of either of those. The performance has been very similar over the last decade. Or the iShares Semiconductor ETF, SOX, S-O-X-X. -X. Which do you think did the best during the 2010s? Again, January 1st, 2010 to January 1st, 2020. Everyone, I know the answer now because Nick asked this 
same question to me earlier this week, but I'll tell you truthfully what I guessed was the Vanguard or the QQQ. That's what I assumed did the best. That is probably going to be, I'm going to guess many people's answer is the broad-based technology ETF with a very huge stilt towards software. A Vanguard Information Tech or QQQ, take your pick. Ironically enough, Casey, this is not even close, but go ahead and, and throw up the chart here comparing the iShares Semiconductor ETF to Vanguard. Again, we're going to use Vanguard Information Technology, but the total return, the, the period of, of January 1st, 2010 to January 1st, 2020, not even close. Total return on the Semiconductor ETF, 477% to a total return of about, about 400% for information technology. Both of them absolutely clobber the S&P 500 SPY's total return of about 180, 190% from 2010 to 2020. But interestingly enough, even if you strip out and focus just on the software, I'm going to use the first trust cloud computing ETF, SKYY, total return of just over 200% from 2010 to 2020. So it, it's really interesting here. It's actually semiconductors that absolutely obliterate everything in the 2010s. So software may have eaten the world, but software was not your best technology investment pick in the 2010s. These returns get even more dramatic if you extend it from 2010 all the way to today. The iShares SOXX ETF, over 1,000% total return. Vanguard Information Technology ETF, 793% total returns. Yeah, that's a 10x investment return on SOX, SOXX. Absolutely wild. One of the best ETFs you could have purchased over the last decade plus. If you invested $1,000 in SOXX almost 14 years later, that $1,000 has turned into $10,000. So this is crazy, Casey. I think this is a nice setup here for what we're going to talk about next because everyone suddenly uh, hyper-focusing on semiconductors in recent months, thanks to NVIDIA and this generative AI revolution. But this is not a recent development, actually. For more than a decade now, semiconductors have been outpacing not just the market, the information technology sector overall as a whole, as far as total investment returns are concerned. Let's go ahead and move on and discuss our performance and our choices over the last year. We're going to discuss our three best calls, and then we're going to discuss some of the not-so-great calls and how we can improve in the upcoming year. Let's discuss our first one, NVIDIA. And everyone by now has heard of NVIDIA, has either invested in NVIDIA or is thinking about it. So why was this a good timing purchase, Nick? Oh, it's a semiconductor business and all semiconductor businesses there is cyclicality due to manufacturing and specifically whenever there's a, a, a switch to a newer manufacturing technology or a new set of products at the tail end of the older products you have this downturn as you gear up for what's coming next and it seems last year in 2022 everyone kind of forgot that this is the cycle this is how it works every say two or three years on on average so not only were we having the bear market that just clobbered literally everything across the board, especially in the technology sector. But you also had this very severe downturn that was cropping up for the semiconductor market as that massive tidal wave of consumer spending from the pandemic kind of wore off. And then secretly, unbeknownst to, to most at the time, this gear up in the data center and cloud market for generative AI servers. And we had that pause and very few knew it at the time, but NVIDIA was going to absolutely command leadership of the market, but everything that transpired since then, the skyrocketing beyond 1 trillion total valuation, that's a surprise even to us, but that's what was coming last year and NVIDIA had been gearing up for it. New chips, very deep portfolio of software products and services as well. 
and positioned to take command of the semiconductor industry as old trends go away and new trends emerge. You can definitely go back and see our many videos that we have about NVIDIA. We've had a lot to say about this company, and we will continue to have a lot to say about NVIDIA. So let's move on to our second good pick, Air Test Systems. Nick, why was this company such a timely pick for our portfolio? It was an emerging growth play. Still is an emerging growth play, actually, even though the stock has done nearly as well as NVIDIA has in the last year. Still a very small business. But in the very, very first video we did, Casey, we outlined three things that were going to happen in the semiconductor industry to lay this foundation for the next bull market. And we've been hearing for years about Moore's Law coming to an end. That's NVIDIA, the need for bigger, more powerful chips and chip systems, not just single processors and increasing the transistor count on those processors, but entire systems. We talked about tighter integration between hardware and software. Again, NVIDIA has done that. Broadcom, another one of our top picks, has done that. Lots of others working on this type of thing. But the third, new materials. Because we often think of semiconductors and we think processing power, computing power. But actually, semiconductors do a lot more than just that. Uh, It's really a story about electricity. And so any system where there's an electric current flowing you're going to have semiconductors managing the flow of that electricity. And so a new material that arose, especially surrounding the electric vehicle industry that has grown by leaps and bounds just in the last year alone is silicon carbide. So historically silicon, the semiconductive material of choice in chips, silicon carbide is silicon plus carbon, increases the amount of voltage that can be managed in these systems, higher heat, weather, some adverse conditions better, great application in EVs and in particular around the battery system and the electric motor. Air test systems helps with the burn-in and quality control of the silicon carbide chips. This is again, one that we've talked a lot about, and so we won't rehash everything that's happened, but we very quickly doubled our money, took some profit off the table, and then our money doubled again on it. And at this point, we're on the sidelines waiting for some of the hype around air test systems to burn off a little bit because the stock valuation is in a league unto its own. That's the short story. We still like air test systems, but we're on hold with this one for a little bit. What about Broadcom? We've talked a lot about Broadcom over the past year. Has this portfolio choice panned out well? Yeah, I most certainly has up about 80% roughly total return over the last year. And again, as I mentioned before, it's not just computing power that semiconductors are involved with. There's also networking. So computing power, energy management, networking is another very important thing. And interestingly enough, whenever you have this ballooning in compute power, NVIDIA has helped unlock in the last year, unless you want to deal with the bottlenecks of data flowing to that computing engine, you better figure out a way to increase the networking speed and the networking uh, throughput, how much data can go through a system. And that's where Broadcom has come in. So some of their new chips geared at the networking part of the market go hand in hand with NVIDIA's GPUs to help increase the flow of information into those generative AI systems. So Broadcom's been a great pick for that reason. In addition to that, they have a great software business that cranks out tons of cash profits. And it looks like they're going to close on that VMware acquisition by the end of October. Stay tuned for more info on that. That could potentially also be driving the stock higher and potentially could continue to drive the stock higher in the coming years as they bring VMware top cloud computing software pillar into the fold and integrate that with their semiconductor business. Excellent. We will definitely keep an eye on this upcoming acquisition for Broadcom and how that will affect their future earnings potential. Let's talk about some of the companies that did not perform as well as we had hoped. And I think number one on this list is definitely Qualcomm. It was one of our top picks for this last year. 
and things have just not been smooth sailing. Can you explain why, Nick? It's pretty simple. Over-reliance on the smartphone market and much like PCs got clobbered in, in the last year, we went over the cliff in consumer electronics demand. Smartphones did the same thing. So now there's this chip oversupply for smartphones. So that has obliterated Qualcomm. One of our worst picks actually down year over year. And it looks like they're still working off excess inventory. Come one year later, here we are. This is still a problem. And until that smartphone market really heats up again, this stock is going to struggle. So this is one that we were optimistic about up through the first half of 2023. And then we started getting really cautious. We already have plenty position in Qualcomm as it is. So we're on hold with this one until we see things start to improve, which we think will maybe begin to happen by the start of calendar year 2024. We hope. What about Skyworks Solutions? This one, I, we recently did a video on talking about their heavy reliance on Apple. Has that changed and how has that worked out over the past year? Right, Casey, basically the same story here. The problem with Skyworks is not only are they overly reliant on smartphones, they're overly reliant on Apple iPhones. Uh, almost two thirds of their revenue comes from Apple products. As Apple has slowed down, it's hurt Skyworks. For years, I've been of the mind that Skyworks would be able to diversify, and they have put some work in to do just that. They made that big acquisition over two years ago of Silicon Labs automotive and infrastructure business, and it's still just a, a tiny, almost insignificant part of the business. And so just not all that long ago, we actually made the hard decision to part ways with Skyworks Solutions. Yes, you may remember that video. It was in August. And after we sold our position in Skyworks Solutions, we purchased a position in Microchip. The last company is not a chip stock at all. It's actually part of the base materials portion of our semiconductor industry flow, and that is Albemarle. And this is one of my favorite companies. Nick, why did this one end up on our not so great list for the last year? Right. Albemarle is a lithium miner and refiner. So we actually bought Albemarle about two years ago, and we, we like the lithium market. Of course, a key ingredient in batteries, especially electric vehicle batteries, a huge ballooning demand for this. So we'll call it semiconductor industry adjacent, even though lithium is not a semiconductive material. Obviously, a critical ingredient in the manufacture of technology devices of all sorts. So when we started buying this at the start of 2022, it did its job as an inflation hedge. It was one of our top performing stocks in 2022. But then as the U.S. Federal Reserve's interest rate hikes kicked in to battle inflation, base material prices started to fall and lithium got clobbered by that. We also had a lot of new demand coming online, which pulled lithium prices off of their peak in late 2022, November 2022. It's been mostly downhill since then. And so like any mining stock, Albemarle is highly sensitive, not just to the increase of supply that they can crank out to their customers, but also the actual price of the commodity that they're selling. So with lithium down 50, 60 plus at times this year, Albemarle has been clobbered. So of these three poor performers that we've talked about, Qualcomm, we're on hold with our current position. Skyworks, we sold. Albemarle is one that we've been nibbling on here the last few months as we're looking for a bottom in the lithium industry and in, in commodity prices. And this is one that we will rebalance going forward. So whenever we see big spikes in the price of lithium, there's probably going to be a corresponding spike in lithium stocks. And we'll rebalance our position, trim it on those peaks, and then buy and bring the position, the holding back up during the valleys, uh, like periods like right now. Going back to the SOX ETF, in the past year, it's had about a 38% return. And just for reference, our historical picks from the last year, the original picks we went with when we started this channel, which you can find on Stock Card, have returned over 100%. Is that right, Nick? 
Yes, it, it is. Most of that r- due to the fact that we over allocated to NVIDIA. We had the air test systems allocation in there. And then quite a few of our other top picks like Broadcom and Applied Materials have outperformed the iShare Semiconductor ETF. So more than offsetting some of the stinkers we just talked about. So our original picks, again, are on stock card, but we have moved away from using this platform. And we're building a website currently where you will have access to our portfolio in an indexed form. So stay tuned for that. We will let you know as soon as we can when that project is complete. Now, let's talk about one other call, Nick, that we made at the very beginning. And you felt very strongly about this. Avoid Intel at all costs over the last year. Do you still feel like that? Because Intel has made some changes over the last year. Intel stock is currently down 4% over the last five years. Is this a new development or has this been a historical issue? Yeah, Casey, it's a multi-decade issue for the whole duration of my investment journey. I bought my first individual stock in 2005. I have never owned Intel stock. And yes, I've been very vocal the last few years about the situation they were in and my skepticism about their strategy moving forward. That was actually our very first real video that we dropped on this channel after our intro was stay away from Intel stock. The stock actually has gone up since then in the last year. Total return is up 33, 34%. So it actually has still underperformed the semiconductor industry ETF stocks by a few percentage points total return. Qualcomm, as it turns out, was the (laughs) far worse performer. At any rate, yeah, I've been critical of Intel. As you said, they've been making some more radical changes, especially in in this last, I would say, three to six month period where it looks like maybe they're starting to gain a little bit of traction. So how has Pat Gelsinger and company tried to right the ship with Intel? What have they been doing to make this progression to a company that's profitable again? Yeah, CEO Pat Gelsinger's original plan in 2021 when he was brought back as as the CEO was semiconductor manufacturing. And for the first year plus, I didn't think there was much emphasis on that, not enough emphasis on that taking place. And all along, I felt very strongly that Intel needed to do a very drastic separation between its chip design and chip manufacturing arms, like what AMD did in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. It looks like Intel is possibly laying the groundwork for doing that. Earlier this summer, there was a really not very well planned out or well thought out in our opinion, investor presentation on Intel Foundry services and how it's been bleeding cash. But at the very least, it looks like they're going to create some separation between the foundry, the third-party foundry services, and Intel design, and give the manufacturing arm some flexibility to go out there and strike third-party deals with other potential customers in the semiconductor industry, like your NVIDIAs, for example, giving them the ability to fully compete with Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, who Intel lost its manufacturing edge to a number of years back. We like some of the recent moves. We're going to talk more about this in the coming weeks and months because we are warming back up to Intel. And at some point we might actually want to even make an investment, but we want to see a little bit more first because as far as what the numbers seem to indicate, the stock is not cheap for current year financials. And even if you look into 2024, earnings are are back in positive territory, but free cash flow is still deeply negative. And It could remain that way, given how much stuff Intel is having to purchase to to get its manufacturing up to speed. So ultimately, that means we're not adding Intel to our portfolio at this moment. And I think we can safely say that our focus really lies in the fact that companies like Intel building these chip fabrication facilities are required to fill them with chip manufacturing equipment. And that is where most of our portfolio has been focused in in the semiconductor. And and this will 
continue to be our focus, at least for the foreseeable future. Casey, we really think there's a coming boom in chip equipment starting in calendar year 2024 that could last a good two year stretch. And this is something we'll talk about more going forward. We still like the Fab Five ASML at least as of this recording, back under $600 a share. We still like our applied materials pick. LAM Research, Tokyo Electron, KLA Core, we own four of of, of the Fab Five, all four of them except for Tokyo Electron, and as well as a few others. We did a recent update on Onto Innovation and what we're seeing happening there for that very small competitor to the Fab Five. But at any rate, this is where we like new money that we're investing going into the semiconductor industry, but we'll update more on on these as well as Intel and some of our other favorite picks headed into the fourth quarter of 2023. So just a couple of weeks away. Again, we want to thank you so much for watching our channel, subscribing to the channel. We have been thinking a lot about how to share more detail about our portfolio with you. And we're working on that. We're in the process of building a website where all of that information would be available in an index style format. So stay tuned. We will get that out to you as soon as we can. And until then, we really appreciate your continued support here by watching our videos on Chipstock Investor. If you're dropping in for the first time, stay tuned for more information on, of course, Chipstocks. We're out of earnings season now, and so we're parsing through some other information that we think could be relevant for the closeout of 2023. In addition to that, it looked like we had quite a bit of interest in an energy stock episode, businesses that are adjacent to the semiconductor industry. So later this week, we will have some updates out for you on Albemarle, Berkshire Hathaway, and specifically Berkshire Hathaway Energy, a very important subsidiary business segment and Warren Buffett's portfolio. And I think the big one everyone wants to know about is Enphase Energy and what to do with that disastrous looking solar inverter system manufacturer and solar system business. So stay tuned for that later this week. Until next time, folks, Nick and Casey out.